I'd like to invite you to please turn with me to Luke chapter 4. We continue our series in the gospel according to Luke. And today we come to Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. This is God's holy and authoritative word. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows In Israel, in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. May God bless the preaching of his word. A manifesto is a public statement of intention. It is a description of how you see the world or how you want the world to be, a manifesto. There are famous manifestos that have impacted many people. Some are much better and truer than others. The Declaration of Independence made clear that American colonies were no longer under English rule. Um, Another manifesto, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, which is presenting uh, the secular ideology of socialism. Uh, 
Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech was a, a kind of manifesto, a much needed call for equality and freedom for African Americans. On a less serious note, uh, there is the, the manifesto for eliminating the world's most hated font. I don't know if you've heard of this, the, the Ban Comic Sans movement describes the Comic Sans font as a blight on the landscape of typography. We call on the common man to rise up and revolt against this evil of typographical ignorance. By banding together to eradicate this font from the face of the earth, we strive to ensure that future generations will be liberated from this epidemic and never suffer this scourge that is the plague of our time, which is the Comic Sans font, according to their manifesto. Here in, in Luke chapter 4, we have what has often been called the Nazareth Manifesto. Jesus is announcing the purpose of his ministry, uh, the reason he came into the world. The time has come for Jesus to put away the carpenter's hammer, and he now steps into the pulpit as teacher. He is filled with the Spirit, verse 14. He was teaching in the synagogues, we are told, in verse 15, and there was tremendous excitement about his ministry as Jesus began to teach. Now, if ever there was a sermon that we should pay attention to, it is the preaching of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You might find many sermons today do not capture your attention and impress you, and it is true that most of us are quite ordinary and average in our teaching. But in Jesus, we have an extraordinary teacher who amazed those who heard him. In verse 15, it says he was glorified by all. Verse 22, it says all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. They heard this one teaching and they marveled. Why? Because gracious words were coming from his mouth. And I can tell you, more gracious words have never been spoken. And if your idea of religion and sermons involves scolding and constant guilt and laying heavy burdens on people, Jesus invites us today to come to him and to hear his gracious words, the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings a message that explains the greatest need in all the world. Everyone is talking today about what is wrong with the world. We all agree that there is a problem. We all agree that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. But there is sharp disagreement regarding our most urgent need. And this is precisely where the voice of Jesus, this is precisely where the teaching of Scripture is needed in our day. Because Jesus both diagnoses the problem and presents the solution. If our greatest problem is political, which is what the political parties and politicians of our day will tell you, if our greatest problem is political, well then, Jesus would come as a political leader. If our great problems were therapeutic, Jesus would have come as a therapist and as a life coach. If our greatest problem is physical sickness and suffering in the world, Jesus would have come as a doctor and as a physician. But because the greatest problem of humanity is spiritual, namely that we are ruined by sin and rebels against God, because our greatest problem is spiritual, Jesus came as a Savior. I'm not saying that, that our only needs are spiritual. I am saying this is our greatest need. Jesus looked upon the world and saw the whole mass of humanity as spiritually poor, captive to sin, blind to the truth, oppressed by the devil. And the good news Jesus proclaims to a broken world addresses this greatest and most urgent of needs. 
I wonder, I wonder this, if you were in the synagogue that day, I wonder what you would think of Jesus' preaching. And I wonder how you will receive his message today. Because the same people who spoke well of him in verse 22 were all filled with wrath in verse 28 and wanted to kill him. Who do you say he is? How will you respond to his message? The main point of this passage is this. Because Jesus brings good news of worldwide freedom and favor, that is, freedom for captives and favor with God, because Jesus brings good news of worldwide freedom and favor, he is to be received by all and rejected by none. Because Jesus brings good news of worldwide freedom and favor, that is freedom for captives, favor with God, he is to be received by all and rejected by none. In his sermon, Jesus addresses the poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. And in addressing these groups and announcing good news for these groups, he is announcing good news to you and to me and to all who will receive him. I want to simply look at, one, the teaching of Jesus, a longer point, and then second, the reaction to Jesus, which we'll touch on briefly in the close. The teaching of Jesus and the reaction to Jesus. First, the teaching of Jesus. What is the message that Jesus brings? This is verses 16 through 21. It is significant that the starting point for Jesus' ministry is teaching. Because he came to bring a very particular message to the world. In verse 16, Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth. This is a small Jewish village of around 500 people in the hill country of Galilee. Jesus regularly attended the synagogue. The text says he did so as was his custom. And there in the synagogue each Sabbath there was singing, prayers, a reading from the law, a reading from the prophets, teaching, and a benediction. And this was the custom of Jesus. And by the way, we should say, if Jesus needed to attend public worship, well then, friends, so do we. His custom ought to be our custom as well. It was common for a lesson or reflection on the scripture reading to be given. But on this particular day, the teaching would be like no other. Luke probably interviewed, decades later as he was writing this gospel, Luke probably interviewed uh, some who were there that day in the synagogue. And we can imagine that unforgettable Sabbath. One of the elders of the synagogue following the announcements, well, today we are very excited to have Jesus with us as a guest speaker he is the, the pride of Nazareth who has been teaching with great skill throughout all of Galilee. Jesus stands up. Imagine it there. He stands up to read. The scroll of the book of Isaiah is given to him. He takes the scroll and he unrolls it until he comes to the passage in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. In the original context in Isaiah, this was a message of deliverance and hope that came to a people in exile, that came to a people in despair. And here's the remarkable thing about this moment. After the reading, Jesus rolls up that scroll, hands it back to the attendant, and he sits down and prepares to teach. In that moment, every eye in the synagogue is locked on him. Even in the scripture reading, there's something different about this man. 
We can feel the drama of this moment. What will Jesus say? And verse 21 is an absolute mic drop from the Savior. He says to them, today, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has been, today is the time for the fulfillment of Isaiah's words. Not that everything that Isaiah said has been consummated, but that the age has now arrived. Today, he says, today is the day of salvation. Today, your life can be changed. Today, you can experience hope and joy. Today, communion with God can be restored. Today is when all your sins can be forgiven. Today. Listen, whatever your yesterday was, however dark your yesterday has been, Jesus has something to say about today. The day of salvation. Jesus is saying the long-awaited time and the long-awaited person has arrived in me. A new era has dawned upon the earth and Jesus declares himself to be the fulfillment of that ancient prophecy. We need to examine more closely the words that Jesus read, the words that he fulfills. One of the striking things about this reading is the omission of the vengeance and judgment which is there in Isaiah 61 too. We heard this earlier in the service. The text, Isaiah 61, says that he is sent to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. That's not in what Jesus reads. It's there, but... He doesn't read it. It is a glaring omission and Jesus very intentionally doesn't include it. The day of vengeance. Why? Because the day of vengeance is yet to come. Jesus will return. And that day is coming when everyone will give an account, when everyone will stand before the Lord, when every wrong will be accounted for. But today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of opportunity. Today is the day of hope. Those phrases, liberty to captives and year of the Lord's favor, those are phrases that have the Old Testament year of jubilee in view. And in order to understand the passage, we need to understand something of the significance of the jubilee. It is described in Leviticus 25, once in a generation among the Israelites, every 50 years, all debts were canceled, land was returned to its original owner, the poor were helped, and any who had become enslaved were set free. Over a 50-year period, some people would do better than others economically, and it was God's desire to give everyone an equally fresh start after 50 years, no matter how much they had mishandled their assets or fallen into debt. That is what the Jubilee is. And so the Jubilee was a year-long Sabbath of rest and refreshment and freedom and celebration. And all of that, Jesus says, is a picture of the liberation, the freedom that he brings. It is best to understand this freedom and healing as comprehensive and as holistic. Just as the peace that the angels announced is not a narrow peace, but is a broad and holistic peace that is applied both now and in the future. So this freedom and this delivery from captivity Freedom from oppression is something that is best understood comprehensively. And this needs to be said because there are some forms of liberation theology that downplay the spiritual aspect of this teaching. 
And there are some forms of fundamentalism that downplay the social aspects of this teaching. Some people interpret the poor and blind in a way that ends up excluding those who are literally poor and blind. That ought not be. If we interpret this sermon in light of the rest of the book of Luke and Acts, which we must do, it is clear that Jesus is describing here the fullness of his deliverance, which centers radically on the spiritual realm, but is not confined to it. We, what do we see in Luke, and what do we see the church doing throughout the book of Acts? Well, we do not see Jesus leading a revolt against Rome or preaching against the political structures of his day. He did not aim broadly at social and political reform. Rather, he creates a new people who display a new way of living. And so Jesus is not talking mostly about poverty, alleviation, and physical healing, although these are included. The main reason he came was to bring a spiritual deliverance from sin and Satan and death. And in fact, the imagery that is used here is used throughout the New Testament. We are the blind whose eyes have been opened. We are the slaves who have been set free. All of this language has strong spiritual overtones in Luke's gospel. There are a number of expressions here in verses 18 and 19, which is really the heart of this passage. Each one of these phrases is music to our ears here today. Jesus brings good news to the poor. The poor are those who are troubled for any reason, especially those troubled by sin. The poor in spirit. And in a world where the poor are so often neglected and mistreated, Jesus brings a message of grace and a message of hope. Good news to the poor. And then second, Jesus brings liberty to the captives. Captives are prisoners and slaves who have been captured in war. As sinners, we are captive in many ways. But the greatest freedom that we can receive is freedom from guilt and condemnation. That is the great need for liberation. That is the great need for freedom from captivity. And Jesus died in the place of sinners so that you and I can be free from the judgment that we deserve. So that we can be free from the spiritual bondage that plagues all of humanity. Liberty to the captives. Third, Jesus brings sight to the blind. Physical blindness, yes, but even more deeply and profoundly, spiritual blindness. Because our greatest need is not to have physical sight, but to have spiritual sight. To know who God really is, to know who Christ really is to know and understand the significance of what he has done, that we would be able to say with Simeon in chapter 2, verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. That we could celebrate with Zechariah light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, chapter 1, verse 79. In Acts 26, verse 18, Luke says that Paul was sent for this reason. It's actually the words of the Lord that Luke records in Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. This is what it means to have our eyes open. What good is physical sight if we are blind to our sin, if we are blind to the glory of God, if we're blind to the majesty of Christ and the wonder of his finished work on the cross. Jesus came to open our eyes, to give sight to the spiritually blind. And then fourth, Jesus brings liberty for the oppressed. Phil Riken says here, the oppressed are those who are crushed in spirit and shattered by the hard experiences of life. That's who the oppressed are. Those who have known evil 
suffering, calamity, abuse, loss, pain, and sorrow. Are you today crushed in spirit? Are you today shattered by the hard experiences of life? Jesus comes bringing good news of liberty for the oppressed. And he would remind us that the day is coming when oppression will be no more. If anyone can comfort the oppressed, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who endured himself suffering and oppression upon the cross so that we who have lived lives of suffering in this fallen world might know the freedom that is coming for those who are sons of God. This is the hope that we have in Christ. The ESV study Bible says, liberty for those who are oppressed, included in Jesus' ministry, healing the sick, casting out demons, forgiving sins, and ethical teachings that promote social justice. That's what Jesus brings. It is a beautiful thing. It is a holistic thing. And this, by the way, is why Christians care for the poor and for orphans. This is why we oppose slavery. It is why we seek justice in society. The church is a community of compassion and equality and justice. Some people, and you may talk to people who say this, or perhaps you've thought it yourself, that Christianity brings hostility, that Christianity brings war, that, that Christianity is not good for the world. I want to encourage you, if you study scripture, and in fact, if you study history, you will see the legacy of compassion among Christians in starting hospitals and orphanages and more. It was, it was Christians. It was the Christians who developed hospitals and health care for all, especially in the fourth century. It is true that Christians have not always been consistent with their standards, but it is undeniable from a historical perspective that true Christianity has led the way in bringing peace and compassion and hope. Jesus summarizes his mission with the phrase to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He came to proclaim liberty, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and indeed he came not only to proclaim these things, but to secure liberty, to secure freedom, to secure salvation for sufferers and sinners, which he did through his death and resurrection. There he has secured peace with God. There he has secured favor with God for we who do not deserve it. And so friends, what the Lord would have us know today is that whatever our needs may be, they can all be met in Jesus. Good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to the for the oppressed. All of this is the salvation that Jesus brings. This is the reason we have titled this entire series in Luke, What a Savior. Because what a Savior we have in this glorious and majestic one who came to set us free, who came that we might have favor with God, who came to deliver us from all the oppression that we have known. J.C. Ryle says, Jesus is the friend of the poor in spirit, the physician of the diseased heart, the deliverer of the soul in bondage. This is who our glorious Savior is. Today, he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, second and briefly, the reaction to Jesus. How will we respond? This is verses 22 through 30. The reaction to Jesus. You see, at first, the people marvel at his gracious words. And then they said, verse 22, is not this Joseph's son? 
They've listened to him teach. They are marveling. Is not this Joseph's son? Who knew Joseph's boy could cook like this? And Jesus knew that they wanted him to prove his claims. He's just laid all of this out as the reason that he came. Today this has been fulfilled. Okay, Jesus, this is what you came to do. Physician, heal yourself. Meaning, show us what you've got. Do here in Nazareth what you did at Capernaum. And Jesus responds by saying that he will be rejected by the people just as the prophets were. Jesus then tells two stories from the Old Testament in verses 25 through 27. Stories of God's mercy and compassion to outsiders. Two biblical illustrations of the good news of worldwide freedom and favor. The first story is from the ministry of Elijah. That's in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, I commend that chapter to you in your study of Luke. You can read that along with considering this. Elijah was sent to none of the Israelites, but to a woman, a widow, who was an ethnic outsider, a Gentile from Zarephath in the land of Sidon. It is the absolute shock of a Gentile being blessed by an Israelite prophet. Second story is from the ministry of Elisha. That's in 2 Kings 5. With Elisha, no ethnic Israelite was healed, but only the Syrian Gentile Naaman the leper, the, the military commander of the enemy of the people of God who was healed when he washed seven times in the Jordan. What's the point of these stories? Why do the people get so mad? The stories accomplish several things. First, they are a brilliant response to their demand for a sign because in both of these stories, faith was needed before an individual saw God move miraculously. There needed to be a faith that takes God at his word. But also Jesus is teaching the universal, multi-ethnic, many nations scope of his mission. He is announcing that the people of God are no longer ethnically defined. He is announcing that the kingdom of Jesus is ethnically different from what they expected and what they desired. This, as you have learned, is one of Luke's favorite themes. The gospel is for people of all nations. John Piper says, it is simply amazing how in your face Jesus was in his first hometown sermon concerning the issue of ethnocentrism. He almost got himself thrown off a cliff for this, for undermining ethnocentrism. And he says by ethnocentrism, he means the conviction or feeling that one's own ethnic group is superior. Jesus opposed it. He is the end of ethnocentrism. Phil Riken says that Jesus in this account wounded their ethnic pride. And Riken says, whenever Jesus said that his gospel was for the world, it always touched a raw nerve of Jewish patriotism and prejudice. People in the synagogue, every one of them, were outraged. Someone said this was like road rage, but you can call it church rage. I want to thank you for not responding to my sermons this way. Just one more reason I love all of you. You don't try to kill me after I preach. They drove him out of town and they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Why? Well, fundamentally because Jesus was telling them that they are no better than everyone else. He was telling them that they too need a savior. He was telling them that they too need lib liberty from bondage that they need sight for the blind, that they need favor with God, which they do not deserve. And friends, you and I need the same. How will we respond to that message? 
How will we respond to the reminder that we need a Savior? This hostility to Jesus is a taste of what's to come. Ongoing opposition that will eventually result in his death on a cross. Three years later, the opposition would become so intense that they would put him to death. But in fact, little did they know, it was through that very death that the good news of liberation and salvation and restoration would spread to all the world. It was through that very death by which the Lord Jesus was opposed by man and put to death on a Roman cross. It was through that death that liberty was secured for those in bondage. That forgiveness was secured for sinners like you and me. That the end of suffering and oppression was secured, which will one day come when Christ returns. All of this has been secured through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ who died in our place and rose to new life on the third day that we might be a people who follow him and live for his praise. What a glorious Savior we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to invite the band to return and I want to encourage each one of you, friends, Friends, receive this Savior today. Receive this Savior. Worship this Savior today. He is the bringer of good news. He is the long-awaited liberator of humanity. He is the fulfillment of the Jubilee, the healer of the sick and broken, the Savior of sinners. Because Jesus brings good news of worldwide freedom and favor. He is to be received by all, every one of us, received by all and rejected by none. And he is to be praised and highly exalted for bringing us liberty, for bringing us sight, for bringing us salvation. We will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. My soul magnifies the Lord. Let us magnify and praise his name together.